You guys can have a seat. <clears throat> well, it's good to be with you guys today. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Um, if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We're going to be, um, we're going to have the scriptures rather behind me on the screen. And uh, we're continuing through the book of Matthew today. We're going through that as a church. We're in uh, chapter 5. Jesus is still in the Sermon on the Mount. <coughs> and um, <clears throat> last week what we did is we talked about how, um, how to deal with a situation when we are angry with someone else. Um, how, how do we respond? How do we deal in light of the significance of anger and, and the consequences of anger in our life? How do we deal with that? But what we're going to do today, and I want you to hear this, is what we're going to do is Jesus is going to talk about how we respond when someone else is angry with us, which I think is a little bit more difficult thing to deal with. How do we respond when someone else is angry with us? And so I want to read you the text, Matthew 5, 23. Let's just jump right in and then we'll get going. So in uh, verse 23, Jesus is continuing the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this. He says, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I want to read that one more time. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar <clears throat> and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Now it's important, church, to remember the context that Jesus said these words. He said these words originally to a Jewish audience. He would have been on the side of a mountain uh, near the Sea of Galilee when he said it. There was a, a crowd of Jewish people that were listening to him. <clears throat> and listen, hear this. The statement that Jesus just made to them was an absolutely radical statement. It's an absolutely crazy statement. I, I'm, if Twitter would have been a thing back then, this, this would have gone viral. This would have trended. It would have made a hashtag, Jesus has lost his mind, right? This, this is a radical thing that Jesus said. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is I want to talk for a second today <clears throat> about why this is such a radical statement. We'll talk about why it's a radical statement because what it does is it gives us some insight, hear this, and how seriously God takes this issue of reconciliation between you and your fellow man. And so if you're taking notes, here's kind of the, one of the main reasons that this is a radical statement. It's a radical statement because of what it would, requ the, what it would have required the original audience to do in order to fulfill this command. It's radical because of what it would have taken for this original audience to actually do what it is that Jesus was commanding. Look at verse 23 again. <clears throat> Jesus, so it says, if you're, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. So let's stop and get our minds around what it would have taken for a person to even be at that place where they're standing at the altar about to make a sacrifice for their sins and they remember they have something against you. Well, back in the, back in the day, if you lived in the area of the Sea of Galilee, <clears throat> there came the time of year where you traveled to Jerusalem in order to uh, atone for your sins for the year. What you had to do is you had to pack up your family, you left Galilee, and you traveled roughly 120 miles to Jerusalem. Now, I, I took a little iPhone screenshot here. Um, if you can see that, that's uh, the site where they think Jesus might have said it, right there by the Sea of Galilee, and that's the distance all the way to Jerusalem. And so that's roughly 120 miles. Um, that's, you know, think about maybe sort of the distance between North Austin and Dallas. All right, you can bring that down. And here's the thing. <clears throat> they didn't have cars back then. They didn't have <laughs> airplanes back then. They didn't have cell phones. And so what you had to do is you had to travel that distance on foot. If you were lucky, maybe you had a donkey, but those things aren't very fast. So at the minimum, it's going to take you about 10 days traveling by foot, maybe 12, traveling by foot from that area of Galilee where he said these words all the way up to Jerusalem, which much of it is uphill. And on top of that, that last stretch of uphill is what's called sort of the dreaded road to Jericho. Now, do y'all remember the significance of the road to Jericho? The road to Jericho is where the story of the Good Samaritan happened. 
You had a guy that was actually doing that. He was traveling up to Jerusalem to make atonement for his sins, to offer a sacrifice at the altar. And that last stretch is really uphill. There's all these caves and caverns and ridges along the road and uh, robbers would hide out in those things and as you were traveling up you had money because you had to buy your sacrifice they'd jump out they'd attack you sometimes they'd even kill you to come and and steal the stuff uh, for you and so that uh, stretch of road anybody coming from the Galilee area would have had to travel through they would have to go through that stretch so look one more time at what Jesus is telling them that they had to do He says, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. And first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Okay, is it starting to sink into you guys what it is that Jesus is asking these folks to do? Okay, you'd packed up your family You traveled 10, 12 days on foot. You traveled through um, some of the most dangerous territory in the country. You survived the the road to Jericho. You finally make it to Jerusalem. You go to the temple. You buy your sacrifice. You stand in line. You make it finally to the front of the line after days and days of travel. And you're standing there at the front of the line. And all of a sudden, you remember that there's somebody back in Galilee that you are not reconciled with. That all of a sudden it hits you, you're standing there, you, you're about to worship the Lord, you're about to offer your gift, you're about to atone for the breach between you and him, and you realize that you have a breach, you have a, have a, a, a conflict between you and someone else back in Jerusalem. <clears throat> what Jesus just told them to do is you leave the offering that you just bought, you leave it, you pack your family back up, you travel back, back down through the road of Jericho, you go the 10 days back to the Sea of Galilee, you get right with that person. You reconcile with that person, pack back up, travel the 10, 12 days back up through the dreaded road to Jericho, get your offering again, and then you go get right with God. It's pretty radical. Now, in today's world, guys, there is there's simply, maybe there is, and I'm just not aware of it, but I don't know that there is a scenario that compares in modern times to what Jesus is asking them to do. I have a buddy of mine that's a pastor that recently took a trip to the mountains of Mongolia, and he, uh, he had to travel for almost two days just by airplane to get kind of to where their airport was. And then from there, he got in a car, and he traveled for two days by car. Um, to where the road sort of ended, and then they packed up, and then they traveled for two days on foot to get where these people were for him to be able to share the gospel to them. Now, my, I'm not very good at math, but the last time I checked, two plus two equals six. And, and the mountains of Mongolia are about as far away as we can get from the United States of America, and my friend got there in six days. So imagine for a second that my buddy, He travels back from Mongolia. He goes to his church. They're having communion that morning, the Lord's Supper. He's about to take it, and he remembers that he has a conflict with somebody there in Mongolia that he met, that there's a lack of reconciliation with this person that's in Mongolia. What the Scripture is literally telling him to do is you don't take communion there. You you pack back up, fly two days, drive for two days, walk for two days. You go reconcile. Then you walk back to drive back to, fly back to, and then you come take communion. And what Jesus just told these people would have been significantly more difficult and probably significantly more dangerous than than even that. What Jesus is saying here is absolutely, positively radical. But again, it shows us how, how radically serious he takes this idea of us reconciling with people. There's another reason that not necessarily uh, uh, makes it radical, but difficult, and it's this. Uh, Read the text again, Matthew 5, 23. He says, so if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. Now listen, I want you to notice, let's leave that up there for a second. I want you to notice that he does not say that if you're at, at the altar and you remember that you have something against your brother, go and be reconciled. He says if you're standing at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, go and be reconciled. Okay, to fulfill this command kind of carries with it a whole other level of complexity. 
right? Jesus, listen, Jesus is not only asking you and I to search our hearts to see if we have anything against anybody else. But what Jesus is asking us to do is to evaluate all the other ways that we might have offended other people. And listen, guys, what I've kind of noticed in life is that to, to admit my own fault in a conflict is a lot more difficult than finding fault in someone else. Y'all with me on that? It's a lot easier for me to look at the other person I'm in conflict with and be able to tell you all the things they did wrong than to evaluate all the stuff that I did wrong that helped cause that conflict. And so what Jesus is saying is that this is such a big deal, that reconciliation is such a big deal that we have to take it beyond what, uh, what the other person has done to us and we have to really get down to the bottom of ourselves and go, is there anything that I've done to them? Go be reconciled. Okay, and kind of the last reason this was kind of a difficult or radical statement by Jesus was, was the speed, um, the urgency, which he seems to be saying we gotta take care of reconciliation. Um, if you got a Bible, I don't want you to turn there, but, but I want you to uh, look at what the next verse says. And we're not gonna spend any time on this, but I wanna just read it to you once. It's Matthew 5, 25. This is the, the next verse. <clears throat> Jesus says, after he says what we just read, he says, come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you're going um, with him to court, lest your accuser hand you, hand you over to the judge and judge to the court and put you in prison. Now we could, have, we could have taken a whole week next week and we could have camped out on that verse and we could have unpacked it. But listen, here, here's the point that Jesus is making here. Listen, Jesus is saying is that if you figure out that somebody has something against you, that there's a relationship that is unreconciled, they have something against you, what he's saying is you can't sit on that. That that lack of reconciliation in your relationships is not something that you put off. Now hear this, what he was trying to show this Jewish audience, because they had an issue with this, he's trying to show us this, is that internal sins are just as big a deal as external sins. And last week we saw that, Um, we talked about how anger if we have unresolved sinful anger in our lives, that that makes us deserve hell just in the same way that murder does, right? And so, and so what Jesus is saying is that if somebody is angry with you, that that is a big fat deal. It's a big deal. And so what you do is if that's the case, you stop what you're doing and you go and you go right now and deal with it before you do anything else even if that thing that you're doing is worship. Now, I read a tweet the other day um, on Twitter, my favorite thing in life, and um, this guy said this. He said, if Jesus, if the Jesus that you serve, if the Jesus that you serve never challenges you or never makes you uncomfortable, then you're probably not serving the Jesus of the Bible. If the Jesus that you serve never challenges you, never makes you uncomfortable, then you're probably not serving the Jesus of the Bible. And, and I made the mistake of going and reading the comments, and people flipped out. Like, what do you mean? Jesus is loving. Jesus is caring. Jesus doesn't want to make us uncomfortable. But they kind of proved his point that they aren't reading the Bible because what the Jesus of the Bible just told us on the Sermon on the Mount, is that if you have unresolved conflict with somebody and you're at the altar, you turn around from the altar, you travel 10 days by foot to the most dangerous territory in the country, and then you get right with them and you do it first. And then you come back and you heal that breach between you and God. And folks, I can't think of anything more uncomfortable than that. But those radical and uncomfortable words, again, I'll say this one more time, are showing us how radically serious Jesus takes this idea of you being reconciled with your fellow man. Now, typically what I would do in a sermon right here is I would start walking through why God cares so much about our reconciliation, because it's key to understanding. I'm gonna do that at the end, but what I'm gonna do right now is I wanna take a minute and talk about, okay, what is this gonna look like in our lives? What's it gonna look like for you to go and and reconcile with people in your life that there's conflict with or that they have something against you, all right? I think the lens that you need to view this through on what this will look like 
The lens that you need to look through is the lens that we talked about a few weeks ago um, in the Beatitudes where uh, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. That was one of the Beatitudes. And I talked about when I preached that text that it's one thing, church, to keep the peace in in a relationship where there's already peace. That's difficult enough. But it's something that's altogether more difficult for you to be a person that makes peace in a relationship where there actually is conflict. Okay, that's that's an entirely different, entirely more difficult thing when for you to be a person that is the initiator, the maker of peace. Jesus did not say, Blessed are the peacekeepers. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. And that's what he's calling us to do in this text. And here's what I've kind of realized is that there's two different types of people that we need to pursue reconciliation with. As you're thinking and applying this in your life, there's probably two groups of people that you need to be thinking about pursuing reconciliation with today. And the first one is this. It's a person that you've actually hurt. It's a person that you've actually offended. That as you evaluate what happened, you can honestly say, yep, I I was the offending party. Maybe you were mean or a jerk to your spouse. Maybe you were in an argument with your roommate um, or with a friend, and as you look back on it, you're like, man, I was having a bad day. I was the reason for that uh, that, that conflict, that lack of reconciliation. Maybe you're in a, a, a relationship with somebody, a friendship, a business partnership, and as you look back, you're like, man, honestly, before God, I was the cause of this thing, it was my sin that caused the breach in this relationship. And those situations, guys, it's straightforward, it's super easy, it's not really difficult. You're sitting here in church, and man, it hits you, you're like, yes, I'm in, I'm in conflict with this person, and you know what? I'm the reason, and so what you do is you go and you simply come up to them and you say, I want you to know that it breaks my heart that you and I aren't reconciled. And the next thing you do is you just own your stuff. You, you just say, hey, here's what I did. Here's what I did to cause this conflict. Here's what I did to hurt you. And then you apologize. You say, you know what, I want you, I, I'm sorry for that. I'm genuinely sorry that I did that. And then you ask for their forgiveness. Will you please forgive me for what I did? And then you stop. End of story. Okay? That's not easy to do, but it's really straightforward You're the cause, you pursue reconciliation, that's the call in your life. Now, the next scenario is a little more difficult. It's a little more difficult, and that's when you know that somebody has something against you, and as you evaluate how it happened, you can honestly say before the Lord that you weren't really the cause, that it wasn't really your fault. Okay, guys, there's been a lot of times in my life where I've found out that Somebody has something against me. And at the end of the day, as I evaluated honestly before the Lord, and I, it, it really wasn't because of me, okay? A lot of times it is because of me, but there have been times that it wasn't. And what is our temptation in those times when we know somebody has a problem with us, a beef with us, but, man, we really at the end of the day didn't do anything? What's the temptation in that moment? I know, I know my temptation is is simply just to sort of write them off, is to ignore the situation. Um, it, it, and, and my temptation is just to absolutely forget about them and sort of move on with my life because, look, at the end of the day, that's on them. It's not on me. This is their problem. But that's not the call. Years ago here at the Stone, um, there, was a, there was a guy that had left the church, and he had sent me an email um, kind of listing out all the reasons that he was leaving the church. Several of them were because of me. The email was actually very cordial. It was not mean, it was not unkind, but he was just very honest with what he saw um, were the reasons that he should leave, and, and I was a big part of that. And, and as I read the email, it kind of hit me, and this was one of those situations that I'm talking about, that his interpretations of sort of my heart and my actions were just dead wrong. I mean, just before Jesus, it was a misinterpretation of everything that had happened. And so I'm sitting there going, oh, he's got all these things and he just totally misunderstood my heart on this. And on top of that, it had been getting back to me that this guy had been doing all this crazy stuff. He'd been gossiping about different leaders in the church. 
He was actively sort of pursuing division and trying to turn people's hearts against the church and that sort of thing. Now, guys, if you think about it, have you ever been in a situation like that in your life where you find out somebody's got this thing with you, this issue with you, and the gospel reality of it all is that sort of what you did to them pales in comparison to what they do to you, but at the end of the day, they're pointing the finger at you and they're saying, you're the reason that all of this happened. That was this situation. And so what I wanted to do in my flesh is just ignore the email. Again, move on with my life. Had a brief moment there where I thought about just writing the word bye and pushing sin. But keep in mind that Jesus does not say that if you're at the altar and they realize that someone has something against you, but it really wasn't your fault. Don't worry about it. Just keep on worshiping because they're an idiot anyway. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus never delineates between who is the guilty party and who's the oppressor. He never delineates between guilt or innocence here. He does not make that delineation. It does not matter. He simply says, if you're at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, period, you go and you be reconciled to them. And so I wrote back to that guy and asked if we could meet. And he said we could. And so he came into my office and I I kind of sort of asked him how that I had hurt him. And he gave me the list again. And again, there's that temptation in that moment to kind of go, well, you know what, dude, you're wrong. Let me tell you all the ways that you've been hurting me and hurting the church. I didn't do that. Instead of using that moment as an opportunity to sort of vaguely apologize and then pop back at him, all I did was I just said, brother, I am so sorry for the ways that I've hurt you. Because by the way, as much as I think I wouldn't have fought, there's always a kernel of truth in something that most people are saying. And so I said, look, man, I'm so sorry for the way I hurt you. I did say, honestly, man, I think you may have misinterpreted my heart in some of those situations, but I'm genuinely sorry that I offended you. Would you please forgive me? Full stop. In there. And he forgave me. Now, he left the church, but we left reconciled. Now, hear me, hear me clearly on this next little three or four sentences I'm about to say. Had he decided to stay... After the reconciliation came, as a pastor of the church, I would have addressed his, his sin. Okay, there are times that we absolutely have to do that. Hear me. If you're in an abusive situation, reconciliation does not mean that you ignore the abuse and move on like nothing happened. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus would not call us to do that. If somebody's broken the law, if somebody's hurting you, if they're hurting themselves, you have to address it, you have to address it then. But what I think Jesus is talking about is the overwhelming majority of situations in our lives where it's sort of a he said, she said, conflict kind of situation. And what Jesus is saying is this is what it looks like for you to be a Christ follower. Jesus says, you be the peace maker. And by the way, um, it's, I, it is, what I'm noticing is that it's people's unwillingness to do this that so many marriages run into difficulty. Over the last couple of years, I've gotten back involved with marriage counseling and I've taken on several couples and I've noticed the pattern. I've noticed the pattern that when a conflict arises, you have one party that's so busy pointing out what the other person did. They're like, this is your fault. You're the reason. When you did this, that hurt me. When you did that, that hurt me. When you said that, that did this to me. You're the reason. You're the one. You're the, and the other person at the same time is like, no, 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 no. You're the one. But hey, when you said that, that hurt me. And when you did that, I felt this way. And they're just so busy back and forth pointing the finger at the other person that reconciliation never happens. And there was this one situation a while back where we had people in, 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 in one of the party's lives that were like, hey, you got to stand up for yourself. And then you had the other people and the other uh, part, spouse's wife that at the same time was whispering in there, no, you gotta stand up for yourselves. And so they'd get together and they'd start to talk about their conflict and what were both of them doing? They were standing up for themselves. How much reconciliation you think has happened there? None. None. That's the world's way. It does not work. I don't know if you've noticed it in our culture. It doesn't work. 
I can't, listen, how many times do you think, and I know that I'm a pastor, but my wife and I have gotten arguments in the past. How many times in the past do you think that when Jennifer and I get into an argument or disagreement, and I look at her and go, you know what? You're the problem. You're the reason that all this is happening. When you said that to me, you were stone cold wrong. This is your issue. This is your problem. You need to get your junk together, woman. How many times over the course of my 23 years of marriage when I did something like that, do you think that she looked at me and went, dear husband, as you said those things, I realize the depth of my depravity. And in your infinite wisdom that you have so displayed through your kind words, humbly ask for your forgiveness, I repent in dust and ashes. Like how many times, honestly, do you think in 23 years that that's happened? Exactly zero times, not, not one time. But I will tell you this, and it's been one of the most transformational things that's happened to our marriage you know how difficult it is to stay in an argument when you've got one spouse that is actively trying to live this out? And at the same time, you got the other spouse that's actively trying to live it out? Do you know how hard it is to stay in an, to stay in an argument when you've got one spouse that is going, you know what, there's a conflict here. I am gonna pursue reconciliation with this person. I'm gonna own my stuff. I'm gonna say I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for their forgiveness. And at the very same time, you got another spouse on the other side that's like, you know what, I, I'm gonna pursue reconciliation here. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna own my stuff. I'm gonna say I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask for their forgiveness. Do you know how difficult it is to stay in conflict when both people are doing that? It's, it's just downright almost impossible. The world's way doesn't work. Jesus has offered us a better way. And Jesus is saying, this is what reconciliation looks like if you're a follower of Christ. It's so important. And that's how I wanna end today, sort of land, start landing the plane here by answering an important question is why? Why does Jesus make such a big deal about this? Why does he care so much that you go be reconciled with a person, even if it's their fault, to the point that you don't um, engage in worship before you get it right? What, why, is, why is this such a big deal? Why is reconciliation such a big deal to Jesus? I'm going to read just a few verses for you. Listen carefully. 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. He said, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of the rams. In Isaiah 111, he's, and this is, this is a very difficult text here. This is God speaking. He says, what to me is the multitude of your sacrifices? says the Lord. He said, I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. He says, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. Now the people hearing that are like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What do you mean you don't delight in all these things? He says, when God said, he continues, he said, when you come and appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? And so the Lord's saying, there's something going on here. You're coming to worship, but what you're really doing is you're trampling over everything. And then he tells them what to do here. He says, bring no more vain offerings. Okay, so their offerings were in vain. He says, incense is an abomination to me. Abomination is a strong word. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of con convocations. He says, I cannot, and here it is. He says, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me and I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Why? Your hands are full of blood. 
The Lord said, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. There are very few things in the scripture that the Lord says he hates, but one of them, as when we come to worship, We lift our hands in the air and we have someone in our life where there is no reconciliation and we continue worshiping like it is no big deal. The Lord says that makes him weary. That the worship of a believer, the lifted hands of a believer, when at the same time will endure a lack of reconciliation with another believer, God says he hates that. And God says this is such a big deal. You go to Mongolia if you have to, to make it right. It's not the outward expressions of worship that honors God the most. Worship is important. Worship is critical. What I think Jesus is clearly saying to us is that it is worship that is combined with a life and a heart of integrity before him that honors him the most, okay? Last thing here, here's here's why Jesus kind of sort of takes this call to reconciliation so seriously, and this is a simple one, because of how seriously he took our reconciliation with him. He wants us to reflect his character, he wants us to reflect his love, that's who we are, it's what we do. We take this so seriously in light of how seriously he took reconciliation with us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, he says, For if this is, this is one of the hardest statements in the whole Bible. We're going to get to it in a few weeks. He says, If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's a difficult statement, that's a strong statement. But I I think this is the point, hear me. Church, that one of the distinguishing marks of a person that truly understands the depth of their forgiveness in the gospel is a person that will absolutely move heaven and earth to display that forgiveness of the gospel in their relationships. If you're a person that really understands everything that God did and everything that he went through to forgive you, then you'll do whatever you got to do. Then the result is is, is you'll do anything you have to do to go and share that forgiveness with somebody else. And so if you're a person that is not willing to either go pursue that forgiveness or go offer that forgiveness, it might be because you don't understand everything that God went through to forgive you. That's what Jesus is saying. Okay, one more scripture here, check this out. 2 Corinthians 5.18. Paul says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Okay, so at the very core, the very nature, the very heart of God's forgiveness of us, of our salvation, it was, listen, it was God pursuing reconciliation with you through the person of Jesus Christ. And so here's the question, What all did Jesus have to go through in order to pursue reconciliation with you? What all did he have to go through to to, to get your reconciliation between you and the Lord, okay? He says, God through Christ reconciled us to himself. In our relationship with God, who caused the breach? In our relationship with God, who, who caused the division? Was it him or was it us? And in our relationship with God, whose fault was it? Who sinned? Was it God or was it us? It was us. We looked at God and said, thanks, but no thanks. We're gonna go our own way. And the relationship was shattered. It was our fault. Now, once that relationship was shattered by us, church, who made the first move? Who made the first move? Who made the first move to pursue the restoration and reconciliation of our relationship? Did we make the first move or did God? God did. He didn't ignore us. He didn't write an email, said bye. 
He didn't stand back in heaven and fold his arms and say, you guys get your stuff together and then maybe I'll come and pursue reconciliation with you. The scripture says that when we were still dead in our sins, when we were still enemies of God, when we were still looking at God and saying, no thanks, he came to us and he pursued reconciliation with us. Now, one couple, I'm not done yet, hold on. I appreciate it though. How far did he travel? How far did he travel to pursue reconciliation? Did he travel six days to Mongolia? Did he travel 10, 12 days from Samaria to the Sea of Galilee to Jerusalem? No, he, he went a little farther than that. Left heaven, came to this planet. Was it easy? Did he, did he leave heaven and come to this earth to pursue reconciliation with you and just see you and sort of snap his fingers? and make it right. No, it was a little more difficult than that. He was born in our flesh as a screaming, crying baby on a cold night 2,000 years ago, and then he lived 33 years every day in painful, complete, utter dependence on the Holy Spirit, walking in obedience with the onslaught of hell coming after him, trying to get him to sin. And then he walked to a Roman cross, was tortured for hours, And then he died, he gave up his life in order to be reconciled with you. If you're here today and and there are relationships in your life that there's no reconciliation and you know it, when it hits you, it's real simple, I'm done. When it hits you, everything that Jesus did, all the links that he went to, to pursue reconciliation with you? How in the world could you not offer that to somebody else? We're gonna sing. And as we sing, I tell you what, if you're here today and you're like, okay, bless me. I actually don't want you to leave yet, but I don't want you to sing. I want you to just let these words be sung over you as kind of an extension to the sermon. And I want, I want your heart to hear afresh these words that when I was alone and I couldn't find my place, heaven reached down and your love called my name. Out of my shame, out of the dead of night into your hope, and into your marvelous light. It's your mercy. I do not deserve your mercy that you would reach down for me and keep me as your own. So now it's your glory. I'm living for your glory, and I will tell the story of your redeeming love. That's you today. Let those words be sung over you. Remember everything the Lord did to come after you and then you'll know what to do. All right, let's pray. Father, forgive us when we have looked at the insults of other people and thought they were a bigger deal than our insults of you. Forgive us, God, when we have looked at the way that people have sinned against us and we thought they were a bigger deal than the way we've sinned against you. Father, I pray that we would be a people that desires and has the power and the ability to to offer reconciliation to people that maybe don't even deserve it because that's exactly what you did for us. 
exactly what you did for us. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it, but you, you came after us anyway. So Father, for, for those of us in this room who have evaluated our hearts and we feel like we're in a good place, Lord, I pray that this worship would be a worship of integrity. It would be a worship of, of, of hearts of people that desire to honor you. If there's people in this place that have been harboring animosity or bitterness for a while. I pray that they wouldn't say a word but that there may be pray to you that you would change their hearts. And that when they leave this place, they'd know what to do. Father, we love you. We do these things in light of what Christ did for us. So we love you, and now we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let's stand together.